Welcome back. You're watching The Farm. Now, India signed its first bilateral investment treaty in 1994 and has since signed a total 83, of which 72 are in force. But more recently, an estimated 18 treaty claims have been filed by foreign investors against the country and its government. And if they win, it could cost us a pretty packet. So the government has decided to review its treaties and draft a new model treaty that is currently open to public comments. This 2015 draft that it has put out has many big changes when compared to the 2003 model bilateral investment treaty. And they start right at the preamble, which no longer talks about fostering greater investment. Instead, it seeks to reaffirm the right to regulate investments. On the show today, Richard Rosso, Nicholas Peacock and Rohan Shah discuss whether India's new draft model bilateral investment treaty sends foreign investors the right message. Companies are out, enterprise is in and it must have a real and substantial business operation in India. So no treaty protection to tax avoidance structures. The definition of investment has been altered to add ownership and control tests. And portfolio investments and debt investments in PSUs don't qualify as investments. The treaty protection under the investment treaty will only be afforded if both the investor company and the investee company in India, both of them satisfy these requirements of management, control and real and substantial business operations. So from that perspective, onerous and in terms of the practical impact, you know, one might say this sort of brings into question everything which happens at least through Mauritius, if not through Singapore. So those mailbox companies are very, very definitely excluded and certain categories of investment are excluded. Judgments and awards are excluded from protection. Um, government debt is excluded um, and uh, for that matter investment companies and holding companies are also excluded. I, I've heard people talk about concerns that portfolio investors would have by being excluded but I haven't actually heard portfolio investors talk about it so I just don't know that portfolio investors necessarily thought because because the investment is relatively fluid um, that they looked at the investment treaty anyways as the main tool that they would need uh, to adjudicate the problems uh, if and when they happen. There are a large number of exclusions and exceptions in this 2015 draft PIT. For instance, it excludes from its scope non-commercial services by the state, tax matters, compulsory license matters, commercial contractual disputes and retroactive changes in law. As regards uh, the exclusion of the provision of non-commercial services by the government, well I read that perhaps as a reaction to the one BIT arbitration decision that has gone against India um, so far, the white industries decision where an award was made in favour of an investor based on um, delays in the Indian court system. And I think you can read an exclusion for non-commercial government services to include within that uh, services such as the court system. Let me just take up the tax measure because, you know, that is the one which has got uh, the maximum engagement in the recent past. But the provision now says, A, a tax measure is excluded. <coughs> B, whether or not a issue is a tax measure itself is not arbitrable. So normally the arbitral tribunal would have an ability to rule on is this a tax measure and therefore does it warrant an exclusion. But relevant to tax measures even that scope has not been left for the arbitral tribunal. Also you know earlier tax cases effectively slipped through normally under the expropriation article and you invoke the expropriation article to say that you know under this. I could legitimately bring a tax dispute also before the tribunal. Now that is also effectively closed. So as you go through this and you know this whole long list, uh, obviously the avenues available to the investor of recourse or of issues which are actionable has been cut down. I think some of these exceptions uh, probably will raise uh, investors eyebrows, uh, they, they will be a concern. Um, but some of them you know, that you mentioned, you know, for instance, compulsory licenses, um, cross-border taxation, you know, broadly the concept of intellectual property rights. Um, for that one, and again, I'm speaking more from the U.S. perspective, since we want to re restart negotiations with India, um, those would be less of a concern because, you know, frankly, the U.S. model also broadly excludes uh, taxation 
um, especially in dealing with countries like India where we already have an existing double taxation avoidance agreement. So we've already got a tax treaty with India. The U.S. prefers to default to the tax treaty when tax problems arise. So that's more or less taken care of in another forum. Uh, and also the U.S. model, you know, it, we don't uh, mention compulsory licenses quite as much as they do in the, the revised Indian model. But on intellectual property rights at large, we default back to TRIPS agreements. There is also a long list of exceptions ranging from protecting public morals to improving working conditions. Well, one of the things you notice actually at the top of the treaty is an express uh, statement of the right to regulate. And I think some of the exclusions that you've just mentioned reflect that right to regulate. Of course, what's interesting is that whereas the protections are more tightly circumscribed and very precise language is attempted to be used uh, in describing the protections available to the investor, when you talk about the exclusions uh, which apply to the government and its discretion in other areas, these are very loosely defined. So it's quite hard to know actually what protection of public morals, for example, means. But that small worry, the biggest change is in the standard of treatment that India seeks to promise its foreign investors. The most common treaty promise of fair and equitable treatment has been deleted. Instead, investors will now receive protection only from denial of justice, egregious violations of due process or manifestly abusive treatment. That's a much higher burden of proof on investors. The very glaring uh, omission in terms of fair and equitable treatment uh, is certainly going to be something which makes foreign investors a little uneasy. Uh, we also have to understand that, you know, what we have now in terms of uh, Article 3 is the three measures which you mentioned, which are a bar. So the government can't do anything, you know, which under customary international law is seen as a denial of justice. You cannot have egregious uh, violations of due process. And uh, government cannot have a measure which is an abusive treatment, which is both continuous and constitutes in a way an outrageous coercion or harassment. So from that perspective, the threshold of what becomes actionable qua government in the context of Article 3 is, is high. The most favoured nation clause has been dropped, local and regional laws are not covered and the government reserves its right to exercise discretion on when and how to enforce or not enforce a law. Again, I think in part you can read that as a reaction to the white industries case where the substantive protection that the government of India was found to be in breach of was a protection that was imported into the India-Australia BIT from the India-Kuwait BIT. And I think that has caused a certain amount of distress and, uh, and the government is, is keen that that should not happen again. But certainly the removal of MFN provisions altogether is a significant departure. As you say, the national treatment standard is also somewhat caveated. It doesn't include uh, behavior of local uh, government. I think also another significant exclusion there, it doesn't include, it says, uh, a discretion exercised by, exercised by the government to enforce or not enforce certain laws. And I think that carve-out is potentially very substantial. You could have a situation where a government, for example, chose uh, to enforce uh, certain laws as a matter of discretion against um, certain investors, maybe domestic ones, and not against foreign ones or against all foreign ones. So that, I think, is a significant departure from the national, uh, national standard. There's a longer definition of expropriation, restrictions on compensation, and fewer powers for the arbitral tribunal. The tribunal shall have no authority to review whether the expropriation was done for a public purpose nor can it re-examine or review a judicial order. The expropriation as an article uh, which normally supported a lot of these investment claims has now been redrafted in a manner that much lesser can really be seen as actionable and secondly even if actionable you know the manner in which it can be tried and ruled on and the consequences of such a ruling you know, all of them in a manner have been curtailed. Coming to the tribunal itself, yes, there are a series of issues here which are said not to be triable uh, by the tribunal. And, you know, in that manner, certainly the scope of what the tribunal can do is lesser. And, you know, there's also the funny situation. For example, uh, somebody would not be able to take recourse if they didn't make a timely payment of taxes.
Now, if they did have a tax demand, one part of it is that that tax demand will get determined under the local Indian law by Indian regulator. But when this issue is referred to an arbitral tribunal, they will also probably have the ability to say, was this a timely payment or not? So, if on the very same issue, you have an Indian authority saying that this is not a timely payment, you have a foreign authority saying, well, there was no payment required in the first instance in terms of the arbitral tribunal, then how do you effectively decide which has primacy? The 2015 draft treaty says in the dispute resolution process, all local remedies must be exhausted before the investor can commence an arbitration proceeding. Now, interestingly, the treaty also provides for the government to make counterclaims if the investor has breached minimum obligations such as anti-corruption obligations, disclosure requirements and tax compliance. That, I mean, overall, that's the biggest negative about the revision of the model. It is a lot more difficult to prove that damages have occurred that damages were done in a way that you know isn't covered under one of the broad exclusions that you mentioned, and the way that you in, that you actually uh, uh, introduce uh, you know arbitration, um, you know the fact that you're supposed to uh, spend uh, uh, initiate in local courts but not exhaust local courts because of course you you can't use the international arbitration to overturn judicial decisions. Um, the fact that you have to prove that local courts have been you know frustrating to some extent so that you can take it out of those courts then um, to spend a considerable amount of time. Uh, trying to negotiate without actually going to arbitration with your partner. So overall, I, I agree. Uh, the, the threshold, I think, um, uh, for how you institute and how you prove the damages and, and making sure that those damages done um, uh, aren't actually part of these broad exceptions, uh, that's the broad area that I think people are going to find is more problematic with the revised model. So will this 2015 draft version of the Model Bilateral Investment Treaty be acceptable to other countries, foreign investors, and why? Even India Inc. investing abroad. Overall, I think an investor looks at the new model and they probably see more red flags than they see good things. That cuts both ways. And so as India Inc., as India companies and Indian uh, PSUs invest increasingly outside India into jurisdictions where they also would like to have protection from investment treaties uh, of this kind. Certainly the standards of protection that the Indian government wants to afford to invest into India. Uh, well, the flip side is those are the standards of protection it will be able to offer to Indian companies uh, going abroad. This is a situation where you are trying to enthuse foreign investors saying they have a certain level of protection. But if they look at it in the form in which it is, this suffers in comparison to what you had, and it also suffers in comparison to what is prevalent elsewhere in the world. Well, like we said up front, this is a draft model bilateral investment treaty and still open to comments and probably will take months, if not years, of renegotiation. On that note, we're going to wrap it up here on The Firm. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next week. The Firm. India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters.